Hello, good evening. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our next Living with COVID update. Tonight's topic is rural management and early treatment to prevent serious disease. My name is Charles Broadfoot and I'm one of the professional development officers with Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging the First Peoples and traditional custodians of all the lands in which we are meeting on tonight and pay my respects to elders past, present and those emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm currently on a Wabikul country. So tonight's session is being recorded and the recording and the presenters PowerPoint slides will become available from tomorrow in our education library on our website. So you can access these by just heading to our homepage, the phn.com.au and then clicking on the education tab. There will be a short evaluation survey and this will automatically pop up when the webinar ends. If you could just take a minute to fill that out before we log off tonight, we always really appreciate any feedback that you can provide us. Uh, please um, put your questions in the questions box at any stage throughout the presentations tonight, uh, but know that we have allocated time after the presentations to go through these questions with our panel of speakers. I'll now hand over to John Bailey, who is an executive manager with the PHN. Uh, John's going to introduce the session, all of our wonderful speakers, and do a quick PHN update. So thanks again for joining us, and I'll hand over to you, John. Thanks, Charles, and welcome, everyone. I, too, would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of lands on which we meet. I'm on Wanneroo land here in Maitland. Tonight, as usual, we've got a really good panel and some really good uh, topics to cover. Uh, we are joined tonight by conjunct Professor Peter Walk, who's a senior staff specialist in respiratory medicine and sleep medicine at John Hunter Hospital. Dr. Michelle Redford, who's a general practitioner with Blackback Doctors and clinical lead for COVID-19 response at the PHN. Dr. Emma Moffat, who's a general practitioner and uh, from Rural Medical Clinic. Dr. Miriam Brutowski, who's a general practitioner with Smith Street General Practice in Tamworth. We're also joined tonight by Lee Clissold and Sharon Nash, who are Acting Health Service Managers at Moree Health Service. Thank you again for joining us. What I'd like to do now is just give you a little bit of an update from the PHM. Thanks, Charles. The next slide. Just to flag for you that uh, PPE ordering for general practice, uh, pharmacy and other primary care providers will change from the end of next week, rather than coming from a small stockpile held by the Primary Health Network, your supply will come directly from the national stockpile and will be delivered via the DHL um, distribution company. The details on how to place your orders will be circulated uh, on Monday of next week and the window for ordering will now close at 5pm the following Friday uh, with deliveries in the following week. It's important that you update your uh, ordering bookmarks or, or QR codes so you go to the new uh, location. So that will commence next week. That includes pulse oximeters for COVID positive patients. Thanks, Charles. And just a final thing that I wanted to provide an update and a bit of a plug for is that Raymond Terrace uh, GPRC has the capacity and the capability to see COVID positive patients, respiratory patients in their clinic at Raymond Terrace. Um, they uh, I spoke to Sarah Bailey this week, who, who said that they're more than happy to assist where practices are either overrun or not able to do that particular piece of work. And I've put a link there to the Hot Doc uh, booking site for the GPRC, and they'll be circulated in the slides after this webinar. I'd now like to move on and hand over to Professor Peter Walk, who's going to provide us with an update on oral agents. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much, John. And um, thanks everybody for inviting me to, to present um, uh, our, our process that we're, we're hoping to put in place for the use of the oral antiviral agents, similar to what we did with the citrovimab infusions to prevent severe disease and complications in people with COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the key thing I think to remember with any antiviral is that things are probably a little bit different to the way we think about antibacterial and uh, treatments where we're using antibiotics. With, with antiviral treatments, it's really crucial that we get in and hit the virus hard and fast and very completely. Unlike antimicrobials where the infection itself generates inflammation and problems, with the viral infections, we're really dealing with a fairly low level of infection and then an intense inflammatory response. And we can see this by the fact that many of the treatments, which we know are very effective for COVID later in the disease state, when people are very unwell and have developed acute pneumonitis, are really anti-inflammatory treatments, dexamethasone, baricitinib, and the antiviral agents, <clears throat> when we're given at this late stage of disease, such as with remdesivir, which was an intravenous preparation, were really not that effective. So with the oral antiviral agents, it is absolutely crucial that we give them early and we hit the virus hard and that they're highly effective agents at limiting viral spread. So you will of course all recall that viruses are of course essentially parasites. They cannot replicate, they cannot do anything unless they get into a mammalian cell and then hijack that cell's machinery. And the oral antiviral agents really prevent the virus from being able to replicate. In the case of um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for causing COVID-19, the virus enters through the ACE2 receptor in many cells, but of course the cells of the upper respiratory tract predominantly, and at least initially. It then has the coating of the virus peeled off it using TMPRSS2 and furin, but allows the virus to enter into the cell and then exposes the viral RNA. Now the virus has to do two things here. It has to replicate its own RNA, but it also has to produce viral polyproteins in order to make viral coating proteins and to be able to reproduce and then spread and infect another cell. So the virus enters the cell, it goes to the host cell's ribosomes, the RNA is translated, and it makes viral RNA or it makes viral polyproteins. And this is exactly where the oral antiviral agents work and are effective. Firstly, there's molnupiravir. Molnupiravir specifically targets the SARS-CoV-2 RNA and causes really quite fatal genetic mutations within that RNA message. By scrambling the message, the virus is unable to reproduce effective viral RNA molecules that will be able to translate into functional virions. Now, the downside to this agent is though, it's not terribly specific against just viral RNA, and RNA is RNA. And so it can, of course, in any rapidly dividing cell, cause similar fatal and serious mutations. And essentially, molnupiravir is highly teratogenic and highly mutagenic. Now, of course, the course of treatment is rather short for all of these agents, and so mutagenesis perhaps is less of an issue, but this is a really important point when we're considering people of childbearing age, and of course, it almost certainly makes this contraindicated in the setting of pregnancy or in anyone who may fall pregnant whilst on this medication, and I'll come back to that in a moment. The other agent, nemaltrovir, inhibits the assembly of the viral polyproteins. So the proteins aren't put together, the virus can't make the coat, it can't make other vital proteins that will allow replication and spread. Now, it's a combination agent, nematrovir and ritonavir, and you may know ritonavir if you've had patients that you've treated with HIV. The ritonavir doesn't do anything against the virus, it just enhances the levels of nematrovir which are present within host cells so that you've got an effective dose there. It works by inhibiting the polyproteins and it doesn't have quite the same level of concern as what we might have with molnupiravir. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the first of these trials was published in December of last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this was molnupiravir. This was a randomized control trial of 1,433 individuals. They were all adults aged greater than 18 years. 
Now, it is really important to point out here that all of them were unvaccinated individuals. They had to have at least one risk factor of going on and developing severe COVID-19, such as serious heart disease, diabetes, obesity, um, or immunosuppressive illness. And they had to receive treatment within five days of infectious symptoms beginning. So you've got to hit the virus early and you've got to hit it hard. Patients received either molnupiravir, 800 milligrams twice daily, or a placebo. And their primary outcome was looking at day 28, hospitalisation or death as a composite outcome. So overall, compared to placebo, they found a 6.8% reduction in the risk of patients going on and needing hospitalisation, or of course dying. And you can see that with the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right-hand side there. So this is a relative risk reduction of about 48% and you need to treat around about 15 individuals in order to prevent one hospitalisation or death. They did not report any serious side effects during the trials. Now there were lots of subgroup analyses that were done throughout this, but, and it's probably a bit hard to see with my slides, I do apologise, the only one worth talking about is the small number of individuals who were found later to have antibody levels against SARS-CoV-2, so who had previously been infected with the virus and didn't know about it. In those individuals who had been previously exposed, no significant effect was seen with the oral antiviral agents in reducing hospitalisation. And so that's really important to highlight those with pre-existing immunity, it's gonna be much harder to demonstrate a benefit. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Up until last week, I was having to um, report on the Pfizer press release because that is all the data I had on the Maltravir Ritonavir or Paxlovid. But fortunately, last Thursday, the paper was published finally in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I look a little bit more legitimate than what I was last week. Anyway, similar sort of trial design. They randomized 2,246 individuals, adults again, all unvaccinated, at least one risk factor for severe COVID, and again within five days of infection. However, their primary outcome looked at those people who received treatment within three days of infection. They did have as a secondary outcome those who received their, their treatment within five days as well. But just that subtle difference there with the primary outcome. So again, hospitalisation or death at day 28 was significantly lower in the nemaltravir group compared to the placebo group. Now this time, the relative risk reduction was larger at 89.1%. But again, this is in those who received treatment at three days. For those who received treatment at five days, it was probably around about 85%. Now this is still a number needed to treat, of about 16 individuals to prevent one hospitalization or death. They also found as a secondary outcome that viral load was significantly less at day five, not by a vast amount, but around about one log. And so it's likely that this would reduce infectivity with the virus. Next slide, please. So, this has really left us with these two potential agents that can be active against COVID-19. But it is really important also to consider the potential problems with both of these agents and the contraindications for their use. Now, I mentioned earlier about the problems of, of teratogenesis and mutagenesis with molnupiravir. And therefore, of course, the TGA recommends that it, well, not recommends its use in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And for that matter, for individuals who are sexually active of childbearing potential, they are also recommended to use contraception and men should use contraception for up to three months after using this agent. Next slide, please. In terms of menaltravir rotonavir, it doesn't have quite the same danger or rating in terms of breastfeeding and pregnancy. It does get a category B3, so it's not completely contraindicated, but it is certainly not recommended in pregnancy or breastfeeding and in women of childbearing potential. Again, contraception is recommended. Now, the major problem, however, with nemaltravir ritonavir is the interaction with numerous medications that you will commonly use. 
The other issues are it is highly dependent upon renal and hepatic clearance. And therefore it is contraindicated in people with severe kidney disease. So a GFR of less than 30 mils per minute and in severe liver disease. A dose reduction can be given in those with a GFR of between 30 and 60 mils. And in terms of interaction with medications, this also is a problem interacting with statins, a number of blood pressure agents, antianginal agents, flecainide, um, antipsychotics, and ergot derivatives, and non-steroidals as well. So something to consider, particularly in patients you might want to use it in. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview of the model of care that we have introduced and has been active since last week. These drugs have got provisional registration under the TGA, which means you can't write a prescription and have them um, given out on the PBS. They are being supplied from a national stockpile through New South Wales Health Pharmacies, but you are able to complete the scripts online, send them to New South Wales Health Pharmacy, and they will dispense the medication. Patients are notified that they are at high risk or your practice is notified that they are at high risk when they complete their online survey through the New South Wales um, Health app. So, um, overview, the model of care was developed really with the view that we have a large population of highly vaccinated individuals and we really are not clear which groups are going to benefit, if any, from this in this context. So we've had to really introduce this under these circumstances where the clinical trials really don't inform us particularly well as to who should be selected for, for, for treatment. Um, you can have a look, this is on the ACI website and it's been live for over a week now, and it outlines the model of care and the criteria, which I'll go through very quickly tonight. Next slide, please. So the eligibility, of course, we need to give these agents within five days of symptom onset. We don't want people with severe disease and established COVID-19. Um, that's obviously going to be too late anyway. And we're really trying to target those in whom we feel they are going to have an impaired immune response, either those who are not vaccinated or those who are incompletely vaccinated and have not completed their primary course, which for now is essentially those without three doses of their vaccine. And then of course, those who are immunocompromised, irrespective of their vaccine status. And by this we mean heavily immunocompromised, and the definition for this is the definition which has been used by ATAGI. We then move on to those at risk of more severe disease in this context, and these are medicine-specific age risk factors. Next slide, please. And this is really the same across the board. Now, this is in fact for citrovimab, um, and this is for high priority cohorts in adults. And you can see those initial criteria up the top there, and then the medication-specific risk factors, which across the board are very similar. So, Pregnancy and children can receive citrovimab, but of course not the other two oral antiviral agents. And then the risk factors, age, obesity, severe cardiovascular disease, um, severe chronic lung disease, type one or type two diabetes, severe chronic kidney disease, severe liver disease, or the immunocompromised. Next slide, please. Each of these tables are essentially the same. This is the nemaltrevir ritonavir, except of course we've excluded people with severe kidney and liver disease where the treatment is contraindicated and here is molnupiravir where you can use it in these individuals but of course we've completely excluded those who are pregnant um, and children. Next slide please. And again for adolescents this is really um, identifying as citrovimab is the only option. Next slide please. and then the flow charts that you can follow along um, when you look at the website itself. Next slide, please. And again, an example, probably a bit too difficult to read online, but again, have a look at the website and that takes you through each of these steps. Next slide, please. 
And thank you very much for the presentation. And we're going to hear from Michelle Redford next. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. That was excellent and um, wonderful to have that overview. And I'm going to talk more about some of the practicalities about um, how GPs are going to go about assessing people for these medications and prescribing them. So I'm a GP at Black Bart Doctors in Newlampton in Newcastle, and um, I'm also the GP lead for the Living with COVID team at Hunter New England Central Coast PHN. So that's how I got involved. And this is the hot topics talk for the past two weeks, but it's mostly going to be about the antiviral medication because um, there's been a lot of information come through about that. And that, so that's where the focus is. Just for those of you who haven't already found it, there is a um, COVID-19 related FAQs for GPs hosted on the PHN website. That's the link there. It, you can't find it by searching. You do need the link. So that's just to highlight that. One other thing that has changed, and Peter sort of alluded to this slightly, is that Atagi has moved from talking about people being fully vaccinated for COVID to using the term up to date with vaccination, which brings it into line with the other types of um, vaccination statements that we might make. And just to be clear about what that means. So if you're five to 15, you need to have completed your primary course. And that would be a three dose course if you're significantly immunocompromised and 16 plus primary course plus if you're three months post your second dose then you have to have had your booster to be considered um, up to date with vaccination and that is now coming into play with um, people who work in aged care facilities where ATAGI have now recommended to national cabinet that it's mandated for um, people who work in aged care facilities to be up to date with vaccination which is going to essentially mean that they're boosted so there are a number of kind of knock-on effects from this so it's just important to know it seems like a little small change maybe but um, just to know that that's where we are. So just talking about um, these medications and as Peter said they're not on PBS because they've been approved by the TGA but we're waiting for apparently they've been fast tracked through the PBS and so this is not just a quick script these are new medications. None of us are going to be completely across the, all the indications, the contraindications, the clinical context. And um, there are a number of steps in the process that are different from when we're prescribing other medications for our clinical software. So health pathways, is abs it's absolutely critical that you're on health pathways for this because that's where you're going to be able to access the forms and that's where all the information is housed. And I suspect this is going to continue to evolve um, none of us have done this before, so um, I think at least Health Pathways is going to be up to date and on it, and it's a fantastic resource, so if you haven't already found Health Pathways, please reach out to the PHN because it can help put you um, into the right place. So these are interim arrangements, and it is image-based prescribing. Now, we did think we were getting rid of image-based prescribing in general practice because we have eScripts, which is a marvel. But no, this is image-based prescribing, so it requires a printed, signed, completed form, and then that has to be faxed or emailed. So there are a number of issues, obviously, like practical issues. You know, if you're working from home on telehealth, dealing with a patient who is also at home because they've got COVID, hopefully they are at home. Um, you know, how do you actually work out how you're going to get the bits of paper to the right places? There's some stuff about how to access pharmacy and um, then really the recording and sharing of information. So I don't pretend to have all of the answers to this, but I think I just want to highlight those things for people. Um, I'll just move on. So I just don't know why this is not working. Sorry, bear with me a sec. There we go. So this is all based on the model of care that Peter was talking about. And um, if you haven't already found it, this is where to find it, that's the link. This is my little mini summary of a little comparison of some of the things some, between like citrovimab and the two antivirals. Now, I love to describe things in generic terms and prescribe generically, but um, these ones have almost got me with their um, nemotrelavir and plus ritonavir and molnupiravir. 
but I will try to keep generic where I can. Um, so as Peter said, the sort of entry criteria for one of these drugs is that you have to be not up to date with vaccination. The studies all really were done in people who are unvaccinated rather than not fully vaccinated and um, have other risk factors, be within five days, have proof that you have a COVID diagnosis, which we'll come to a bit in a minute, and um, not require oxygen. So that's before you've even started. And then there are other criteria as well. So just going through there, you can see that a lot of a lot of these patients that you might come across may be actually eligible for citrovimab, and your decision making is going to be between access to citrovimab and access to Paxlovid, which is your first line of the antivirals. It's quite clear in the ACI guidance that that is preferred over um, the Gebrio, if I'm saying that right. Um, and they have sort of similar sets of indications, excluding pregnancy, because you can't give um, either of the oral antivirals in pregnancy, as, um, or they're not recommended, as Peter said, because of the concerns about teratogenicity. So in pregnancy, you're really only looking at citrovimab, but those are in patients who have an additional risk factor. So they're patients who have obesity or cardiovascular disease or severe respiratory disease. They're not and are unvaccinated or not up to date with vaccination. They're not just second or third trimester of pregnancy and no other risk factors. So just to be clear on that. And as you can see, um, there are some other significant concerns, you know, if you've got renal impairment or significant liver disease. So really the population that you're going to be thinking about is going to be for oral antivirals is mostly going to be people who have significant risk factors. So that might be your indigenous population who particularly where they're not up to date with vaccination, unfortunately, um, and also people who are in RACFs. And so that's potentially where um, there's going to be most use for this. And that's, so that's where the drugs have been distributed to at this time. So. So how do you do it? So first of all, you've got to cite evidence of a positive COVID test. So that's either the positive PCR result that you might get from the lab, or um, the patient can provide the text message that they got from New South Wales Health. Um, or um, if it's been a rat, they have to have registered that with Service New South Wales. You have to confirm the eligibility as Peter went through the eligibility and I've just sort of gone through it a little bit there. You need to look at interactions, contraindications and precautions. So these are the links to the drug the specific drug guidelines for these two drugs. And I'm not going to go through that in detail as pages, particularly bearing in mind the um, drug interactions for um, the nematrivir and ritonavir. Um, and they are listed on the back end of that um, PDF. And then you've got to have a kind of informed consent consultation with this patient, which I think requires you know, quite a significant knowledge of these drugs. So it is tricky. Um, there are, there's lots of um, paperwork to help you though, and um, the suggestion is that you provide those information for patient sheets. Then document all of that and verbal consent, because you can't get written consent because they're on the other end of a telehealth link, hopefully, not in front of you. So that's part one. So you've worked it all out, you're good to go, ready to prescribe. Part two, you need to access this form. This form is housed on health pathways must not download this form and save it somewhere that people can get at it because it is a prescription and so it is to be protected. It needs to be, um, you can download it, you can fill it in electronically and then you have to print it and sign it and then scan it really because you have to get a copy of it into your records. You need to send the whole thing to the designated hospital pharmacy of which we have four in Hunter, New England, and one in the Central Coast at the moment, and I'll come to that in a minute. And then ideally give page three to the patient. So maybe scan it in two separate bits. Page three has got patient information. Um, it's got QR codes to patient information. And then because this is image-based prescribing, you have to keep your hard copy for two years. So I would want a copy of that in the patient's records and then a hard copy for two years with me so far, hopefully. So part three, then you've got to get all the bits of paper to the right places and make sure that it's actually happening. So that form has to be either emailed if your practice policy allows email. 
and you know within your privacy policy whatever or facts to the pharmacy personally i would want to know it's been received and that something's going to happen but there's not really that step in the process but that's, so that's maybe just me being a bit pedantic and record that you've done it in clinical software now what i would want to do is to actually record it as though it's been prescribed and so this is a screenshot from where i have you know done it on a test patient and i'm sort of marking it as do not dispense for records only and then marking it as printed that means that then if in three years time when all the hard copies are gone suddenly it comes out we have to check all these people's renal function i can just do a search in best practice for the ones i've described look you probably don't really need to do that but that's my workaround for that eventuality i think the records are being held centrally through the lhds as well then the pharmacy contacts the patient and arranges collection or pickup, which of course is not going to be the patient because they're in isolation, then you've got to determine the need for ongoing monitoring because presumably this is in the setting of someone that you've just found out has got COVID. If you're trying to get the medication from the stockpile that is held in an RACF or in an Aboriginal health service, then there is a separate form that looks very similar to the form that I showed you but that's submitted via email to the CEC. And so there's some central documentation of who's been given it. And then if you're in an RACF, you have to write it on the drug chart. And if you're um, dispensing it yourself, then you have to follow the usual rules of dispensing. So it has to have the full um, details on a label. Um, so that's part three. It's quite, quite the process via telehealth. Good job, we've got good at telehealth. Um, so pharmacies on the Central Coast, Gosford Hospital is the designated pharmacy at the moment. This is an evolving space. Um, they have said that a service is available um, seven days a week. In Hunter, New England, it's going to be John Hunter, uh, and it already is, is they're, they're good to go. So you've got John Hunter, Manning, Maitland, and Tamworth, and they are open nine till three on weekdays. So there are some discussions going on about weekends. Right now, it's not available in Hunter, New England, pharmacies directly at the weekends, but there are discussions going on. So that's what I have about antivirals. Happy to take questions at the end. Just a reminder about Kahoot. There'll be a Kahoot coming out this week about, guess what, oral antivirals and all of that. Um, this is an old one. Hopefully everyone knows the answer to that. Please don't do this. Give four-year-olds the pediatric Pfizer vaccine. Um, other great questions that have come up this week, the PHN is providing um, a new service to First Nations people to get vaccination support. There's an online form that can be filled in and um, patients can get help with travel or booking or accessing um, COVID-19 vaccination. The question that keeps coming up is how often do people get PIMS TS? And this came from Atagi, approximately one in 3,200 children who, um, who catch COVID will get um, the inflammatory condition. Moderna spike backs, yeah, it has been approved by the TGA for six to 11s. It is not yet um, subject to a target guidance. We can't start giving it to six to 11s yet. So we just hang far on that. And the question came through about, um, can we use a smartwatch like an Apple watch for pulse ox? So my answer to that is no. Um, pulse ox limits are regulated by the TGA as medical devices and no smartwatch pulse ox limits has been approved by the TGA. So I don't think we should be recommending them. We just stick to the ones that are. And that's it from me. If you have a great question, please submit it. Love to get your questions. There's no such thing as a bad question. And um, see you later at the panel. I'm handing over to Sharon and Lee from Maury to hear about how they have managed COVID um, and Satrovimab. Hi everyone, tonight we're just going to um, speak about the COVID response um, that Maury had back in November when we had an um, outbreak here. Next slide please. So back in early November we became aware that there was COVID positive cases in the community and we had two women that were inpatients in our maternity unit that were identified as close contacts. Both of them tested negative with um, a quick test. However, we isolated them overnight and then discharged them the following morning. Next slide. Um, we needed to prepare 
for possible admissions of COVID positive case um, cases. And we did have a COVID plan that we had already um, developed and we put that into action. In the first couple of days, we didn't have any uh, changes to our elective theatre. But in week two, we ceased all our elective theatre because we had to change the location of our maternity unit up into our um, recovery ward because the maternity unit became the designated COVID red zone for the hospital. And in ED, the mental health safe room became the COVID red room or red zone. Um, and the staff in ED and maternity then started to wear their PPE, N95 masks and protective eyewear at all times. Next slide. Um, so with testing, we actually had some external providers that came on board very quickly to help us. So clinical labs actually um, came and took over the um, swabbing clinics for us. So that was a great help. Um, we had a LEAT machine sent to Moree. Um, SIDPATH provided that, who's our pathology provider on site, and they were able to process the PCR in 20 minutes. And we also had another rapid um, PCR testing in our own lab that took 50 minutes. And then we had a large rat supply sent to Moree to be able to be distributed to people. Next slide. So at the start of the day, there was a process that we went through. So we received a red list from um, Hunter New England that gave us a list of all the positive cases. We also then received a list of patients that were unvaccinated and at high risk of disease, so were eligible for citrovimab. And these people were then were identified through the COVID doctors that are based in Newcastle. We also had a daily huddle with the hospital in the home from Newcastle. Um, we had patient COVID transport that was actually sent um, from Newcastle up to us so that we had a way of getting patients transported around the town that needed to. And also we started the COVID ward infusion lounge. Next slide. Um, we received daily data, and this is just an example of the daily data that was sent out to us just to tell us what active cases were out there, the people involved, and it, we've just got a, one of Tinga and Inverell on there too, just an example. Next slide. We also had a COVID dashboard that we could log into and see more information on that, and that was updated um, regularly by Hunter New England Health. Next slide. So with citrovimab, we've talked a lot about what the indications are um, for having that. So I won't go through that again because it, it's, everyone's discussed the same thing. Um, next slide, please. We've also talked about what the contraindications are. And what we did very early in the um, process was actually do a flow chart so that we could have basically a checklist to know that we did everything for anyone that was eligible for citrovimab. So we made sure that we had the, um, with the patient, their proper details, whether they had access to transport, whether they, um, we needed to advise them to wear masks and advise of the time to arrive at the health service and where actually to come so that they weren't going to expose anyone else to COVID. Um, with the medical officers, we had two medical officers that were actually um, kind enough to offer their services to provide the prescription for the citrovimab um, and also to provide um, drugs to be written up in case there was any anaphylaxis. So we had just initial drugs for the treatment of anaphylaxis written up by those medical officers. Um, we also made sure that the patient had a consent in the COVID doctors in Newcastle actually obtained the consent from the patients and, used, and emailed those to us so that we had a consent on, um, on record and also so that we knew that the patients had been appropriately informed. With the nursing staff, we just had to make sure that there were two nursing staff available to administer the citrovimab to make sure that they could check the drug and mix the infusion. They followed full droplet precautions. Um, buddy checked, did all that sort of stuff. With the doc documentation, we had to monitor the patient for the 30 minutes that the citrovimab infusion took and then also for an hour after the administration. So we needed to have appropriate documentation available um, and so it could be filled out for the patients. 
And then the infusion itself, we followed the PCP from Hunter New England Health, um, the use of subtravimab in COVID-19 patients. It's freely available on the intranet. And we had the medication located in our chemo unit because it being a monoclonal antibody, we wanted to make sure it was um, actually stored appropriately. Next slide, please. Um, so with the evolving nature of um, the COVID outbreak and then um, knowing that we would eventually have to keep giving citrovimab infusions, we actually had um, one of our wards, none of our wards in Moree had doors on them. So we had a door put on a ward so that we could put some extraction fans in there and simulate a negative pressure um, room because we didn't have a negative pressure room here at Moree. So this is just um, an updated flow chart and um, just the signage that we put on those doors. Next. And that's a picture of some of our staff that were working in the infusion lounge when it was up and we were giving the citrovimab because we gave quite a few infusions. Look, some of the barriers that we um, actually came up against were a lot of the patients who were presenting to us were actually former intravenous drug users. So their venous access was actually quite hard. And we did have some people that there was no venous access um, that could be um, found. We had experienced registered nurses who were in cannulating the patients. Um, that was very important to make sure we had experience. But then we also sometimes had to get our GP anaesthetist to come along with an ultrasound to actually get access for them. Um, some of the successes that we had were the medical officer buy-in was excellent. They were really cooperative from the beginning and really wanted to make sure these people got these drugs to stop that disease progression. Um, next slide. Over to you, Lee. Lee, we might be having some difficulty um, hearing your audio at the moment. I can keep going if people could hear me. Yeah, we can hear you, Sharon. Okay, then we'll, if Lee's quite happy, I'll, I'll present this bit. Um, so from the community health point of view, they did a fantastic job at looking after the patients and providing services to, to the people who couldn't um, access the services because they're in isolation. So once again, um, Monday the 1st of November was when we had our first index case here in Moree and then by Monday the 8th we had 110 active cases. Um, so Initially, our swab clinic was just inundated, 900 swabs within the first five days. Um, in three days in excess of 250 swabs per day were um, being done with our own staff before that external provider came in to help us with, with those swabs. Next. Um, so what we think the community health response to COVID would be. So hospital in the home was um, a very big help. So the COVID positive patients and children were treated through hospital in the home. And it was this is a centralised unit that's run out of Newcastle. So Lee had a lot of contact with them. They initially advised us that our role would be to drop pulse oximeters and symptom management packs to the mailbox of all these COVID positive clients. Um, so what did the response actually entail rather than what we thought was going to happen? Community health had um, been dropping off oximeters and symptom pack um, to the patients. They were delivering food hampers. They were delivering PPE and cleaning products to isolating households. They were having daily huddles with the hospital in the home team. They were doing welfare checks on patients who might not have been able to be contacted any other way. There was escalation of care for clients who were deteriorating and needed to probably have some more medical help or um, any other really, any help around the house that they couldn't get because they were isolating and also referrals to um, other service providers. 
Um, they were assisting in the assessment of clients post citrovimab. They were arranging transport for clients from hospital to hotels, from home to the hospital, um, all that sort of stuff. They were actually handling all the hotel requests. So we had a couple of um, hotels in town that were providing um, rooms for patients with COVID. Um, they were doing fit mask testing. They were donning and doffing in infection control education, delivering this to the hotel staff where the, um, the COVID positive positive patients were. They were handling swab clinics and they were sending people out to do swabbing in homes for close contacts who were then developing symptoms. And they were also doing vaccinations opportunistically. So these are the isolation packs that were provided to the COVID positive people in the households. So we've got pulse oximeter, paracetamol, digital thermometer, and then some information. Um, these are some of our staff that were working in the swab clinic. Worked very hard. Um, and some of the hurdles that we came up against was being a small rural health service, we do not have a lot of flex with our staffing. So staffing was actually a real issue because um, we only have a finite amount of people and trying to cover all these extra bits and pieces was very difficult. Um, social component, so when you were going out and, and seeing people, they knew you were working at the hospital and had been involved with COVID positive patients, so they didn't really want to have anything to do with you. Um, the home swabbing was difficult in getting people to go. And what worked well, oh, sorry, <laughs> the weather, we had lots of um, rainy weather during that time. So that was really, really difficult to um, be having swabbing clinics when we didn't really have anywhere with cover. And the border closures made it quite difficult for us because our um, community health service extends right up to the Queensland border. And it became quite problematic that people couldn't get across borders to have tests or to, um, you know, get treatment. Um, and what worked really well was teamwork. The community health team came together really, really well and did an absolutely outstanding job for the community of Moree. And the Aboriginal health workers really did lead that COVID response in the community because the majority of our um, COVID positive patients in that outbreak were Indigenous clients. The Aboriginal health workers just work wonders with being able to liaise and represent their community. So these were the statistics up until um, um, December. So we had close to 500 home swabs that were completed. Um, we had 234 positive COVID cases um, in the beginning of December. We had de-isolated 204 cases at that stage. There were two transfers to Tamworth Rural Referral Hospital for people who became quite unwell with um, respiratory symptoms and requiring ox oxygen support. Um, there were no intubations on any of the patients from Maury and there were no deaths. So this is the room that I described before that we've put the door on and we've got those extractions fans in there to try and simulate some sort of ne negative pressure. Because we, our facility is quite an old facility. Um, so having negative pressure rooms and doors on wards, it's just, wasn't there, so we've tried to do what we could. Um, the swabbing clinic does remain open um, here at Moree District Health Service, and we uh, have got reduced hours, um, but still left the community to access. The community support for pulse oximeters does continue for any of those high risk clients. We are still doing um, one or two citrovimab infusions each week. Um, we have received a supply of the oral antivirals that have been discussed in previous presentations. And these are going to be considered for people who have difficulty, difficulty accessing the hospitals for infusions. And as we've discussed previously, aged care facility residents, remote locations and people with poor mobility. So we had an email from um, Dr. Jenny Borton at the COVID team in Newcastle. And she really praised what was done in Moree. And basically she said that Moree had been the district's golden child re 
with regards to the COVID response that we've offered. She commented on, on our thoroughness, commitment to the people in the community, and was very clear that the reason nobody had been seriously ill or passed away was due to our efforts in tracking people down, getting people the infusions, and doing our best to ensure that COVID positive and close contacts were looked after. She actually quite became a little bit teary when she was talking to us. Um, because she was reflecting on the high quality of the response that she'd offered. And she tells me that everyone in Newcastle thought very highly of us and wished that we could show other sectors how to manage the COVID outbreak. And she was eager that everyone was um, informed of this. Um, so some thanks and assistance, people who really, really helped us out. Paul Craven, and who's the COVID medical lead for Hunter New England Local Health District. The public health doctors were fantastic. The hospital in the home and the COVID doctors, they just stayed in contact with us all the time and really, really helped us out. We did have some surge staff that came from Tamworth and John Hunter to assist us, and that was greatly received with those staffing issues we had initially. And the Maury Hospital Community Health, who, and they are led by Lee Clisold, my colleague who's on this presentation tonight, who really set up a truly amazing service for the community and during that COVID outbreak. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon. And um, sorry we couldn't hear from you, Lee. Um, of a technical issue there, but we'll hand over now to Dr. Emma Moffat, who is going to chair some of our questions and I'll ask all our panelists to pop their camera and their microphone back on so we can have a bit of a chat. Thanks everyone. All right, thanks to all our presenters for all of that information um, and particularly thanks to the Maury people who set up an excellent um, response and the, the outcomes were truly amazing for um, the numbers that you had. Um, so well done and we all hope to take something from that. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone to pop the questions in the chat box if um, you have any questions. So I think we got a correction from um, Gillian um, saying that on the Central Coast the forms have to be emailed to the um, COVID care team and I've I'll, I can just probably just pop that on the, I'll just share my screen just quickly. So she has put it in the chat, but if anybody needs to get that, um, it will be on Health Pathways. But, um, that's Thanks for that. Working now? Um, I was just interested to hear that there was a supply of antivirals in Moray Hospital. Is that right? Turn this on. Yeah. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. We'll be frozen. She's turned her mic off now. Lee, just turn it on again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Ah, sorry, we're having a few technical issues here. Uh, that's right, we do have a, a supply arrived um, last week. So we haven't actually accessed any of them yet, but we do have a supply. Okay. Can I speak to that, Emma? Because I got an email yeah. earlier in, in the weeks from um, Ruth Martin and Sandra Fitzgerald through the PHN and they've been working really, really hard to try and increase the supply of medications across the region, recognising that these medications are coming through hospital pharmacies. So um, she mentioned that there is stock in Tamworth and Armidale going to Moree and Narrabri. So it sounds like that's already in Moree and Narrabri, which is fantastic. Um, she also mentions that there is a recognition that um, the time and travel time from some of our smaller um, towns to even those hospitals is going to be a bit of a impost. And so they're working really, really hard on working out how they can do that, whether they have pre-packaged packages that are of medications available in some of the EDs that can be given out by the GPVMOs that work in those regions. But they're working really hard to try and increase the availability of medications across our region. And we're working with them to give some advice around that space. So that's been really encouraging. Uh, 
Um, any other questions? Nothing coming up in the chat. Is it worth maybe going over the Citrovimab criteria again, just because that came up in the questions? Hmm. Is that okay? Do, would you, do you want to do that, Peter, or I can do it? Um, so I, it, it has changed subtly, but it was more to bring all of them in line with each other um, and to free up um, the interpretation of the citrovimab, it, it, it was probably a little bit ambiguous um, and you could easily interpret it that people who were under the age of 65, if they weren't Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, they, they had quite a hard time of getting it. Um, it, it look, the, the, the criteria are pretty much the same across the board now um, for each of the indications, apart from where you've got contraindications for the, the nature of the agents. Um, and citrovimab is obviously your go-to early intervention for children and pregnancy. So I think there have been a bit of confusion, sorry, about um, you know, whether you had to have an additional risk factor, but I think it's really clear now in the task force um, flow charts that um, unless you're immunocompromised, um, you do have to have an additional risk factor. So hopefully that's clear for people. Yeah, that's that was, absolutely correct. That was what I was going to ask, Michelle. Sorry, that clarification. Oh, sorry. That's all right. No dramas. It has We're been on the same error. page. Yeah, it has been tricky. Okay. The, I'm the not criteria, seeing any other questions. Sorry. I, I guess it's, it, look, it's reasonable to say that at the moment the criteria are fairly restrictive in many ways, um, and I think that's a fairly a pretty fair comment to make. Um, that may change over time as our supply and logistic issues ease up a bit and we get a little bit more um, available. Um, we're also watching very closely on a statewide basis the usage of the agents. Um, despite the fact that these criteria do appear quite, quite um, stringent, um, we were getting a lot of citrovimab into people and, and while we were concerned that we weren't getting it to the people who would need to, um, since we've had the rats um, registered on the on the um, New South Wales um, app, uh, it, it looks like we probably have been. Um, so averaging around about 200 infusions per 10,000 patients. And, and we think that that's probably about right given the criteria that we've, we've set there. So it's pretty good, pretty good effort on everybody's part, I think, getting people people in and, and uh, you know, the Maury example is a fantastic one about about getting those infusions and infusions are not easy to do. Obviously the oral agents will be somewhat less challenging, but, but nonetheless. There is quite a tablet load as well with the oral agents, which maybe um, yeah. I sort of skipped over slightly, but um, you're talking about three or four tablets or capsules twice a day for five days. And so if the population that you're prescribing this in are potentially in residential aged care facilities, that does come. Mm. You know, with its own challenges, um, there is now like, on health pathways or going on health pathways how you can um, use the capsules and how you can um, um, break those up. But for people who have oh, okay. following and things, so there are some of those emerging resources coming out. But it's just there's just lots, there's <laughs> just lots of information. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I I'm um, looking. Sorry, Miriam, did you want to add something quickly before we really wrap quickly, up? Yes, I recognise the time. I, I just know, um, just want to let people know that there is a group of rural doctors meeting on a regular basis to have conversations about how we um, brainstorm and help um, our partners in the PHN and the LHD understand some of the issues that we have, but also for them to help inform us about what's happening in our spaces. So those meetings are happening on a Wednesday, once a month now with the whole group from the LHD, AMSs, PHN and local GP from Northwest, New, South, uh, New England and Barwon. Um, and so um, if you've got questions, if you get in contact with your representatives from those areas, um, that would be great and we'll keep you informed. But we're raising the issues around logistics and process and just our experience. And that's been informing a really, really good response from the LHD and the PHN. All right, I'll hand back to Charles to finish off. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thanks very much, Emma. Um, thank you. Perfect timing right on 7.30. So, of course, thank you everyone for attending this evening and for entering your questions. I'd like to take the opportunity 
to thank all of our speakers tonight for generously given time out of your schedules to be here and we do really appreciate it. Thanks again. Um, a reminder, the session has been recorded, so if a colleague has missed it tonight and they'd like to catch up, um, they can watch it in our education library on our website and that should be up um, by tomorrow. There'll be a short evaluation survey that will pop up in a moment when I end the webinar. If you could fill that out, we really appreciate uh, any feedback that you can provide us. So that's all. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.